Uh, welcome to The Verdict, Kent Myers and Mick Cornett getting with you again this morning, uh, talking about a very timely subject. Uh, Mick, how have you been, by the way? Oh, staying safe, mostly inside. Good. Well, uh, we've got uh, All Things COVID is the name of our show today. Well, gee, that's kind of topical, isn't it? I mean, it, uh, that's a word that, uh, you know, probably was rarely used uh, in Oklahoma or anywhere else uh, a year ago, but but now it's a word that you hear almost on an hourly basis. I mean, it's, it's consumed us. Well, it has, and we've got uh, one of the, uh, uh, a national expert who happens to be in Oklahoma and also as our guest today, Dr. Dale Bratzler. Well, there, and there's always new information coming out, so I look forward to hearing from Dr. Bratzler today. Well, uh, you're watching The Verdict, folks. Uh, Mick and I will be back uh, in just a minute with Dr. Dale Bratzler. I was very lucky to have Holmes Tuttle as my father. In 1965, my father and two other prominent businessmen in Los Angeles went to Ronald Reagan and encouraged him to run for governor. As time went on, they garnered a, a number of other prominent people to support Reagan, and that's what became known as the Kitchen Cabinet. I'm Bob Tuttle. I'm the former United States Ambassador to the United Kingdom, and I'm very proud to be a Chickasaw. On the day that President Reagan was inaugurated, and there were my parents, uh, seated very close to the president in the presidential box. And I thought, you know, maybe we wouldn't be here without my father. That was a very, very proud moment. I can remember him saying to the president, Ron, this is what I think is best for the country. Every time I come to the library, I walk down the colonnade so I can take a look at that beautiful plaque. I think of my, my parents to see them there and know how important they were to the Reagans and how important the Reagans were to them. And all he wanted to do was to do what was best for his country. When my father had passed away, President Reagan spoke at his service, was, was very moving. And I think part of his growing up in Oklahoma um, made him love his country, love his nation, and uh, the pride of being a Chickasaw. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at profilesofanation.com. One of the best kept secrets about the Post 9-11 GI Bill benefit is that it can be used at a trade school or a technical school, and it doesn't have to be used at a university or college. These are benefits that the veterans have earned through their service, and they should take advantage of it. Veterans really need to understand that there are many resources offered by the Oklahoma Department of Veteran Affairs. They are there to help you find the right school for you, the school that will help you and your family make great steps into your future. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. This is Kent Myers with Mick Cornett, my partner for uh, many, many years. Uh, we are going to be visiting today with one of Oklahoma's leading experts uh, on COVID-19. And he, thank goodness, is uh, as school is beginning to start, he's also the chief COVID officer at the University of Oklahoma, where there are an awful lot of folks getting ready to uh, become students again. Uh, Dr. Bratchler uh, is board certified in internal medicine. Uh, he is a fellow in the Infectious Disease Society of the United States. He's given nationally over 600 lectures on health uh, issues and including COVID, among other things. This is his first visit to the verdict. Dr. Bratchler, really glad to have you. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. Dr. Bratzler, your formal title is Chief Quality Officer for OU Medicine Enterprises. That implies a pretty broad range of responsibilities. How would you describe what you do? Yeah, so um, in uh, 2018, I was appointed the Enterprise Chief Quality Officer for OU Medicine. 
uh, which puts me in an oversight position for patient safety and quality across the entire enterprise, which is our, our three hospitals in the OU system, and also the faculty practice, the ambulatory practice. Um, and so I've been doing that since 2018. Before that, I was the chief quality officer uh, for OU physicians, the faculty practice, of the university. Um, if you're not aware, hospitals have a large amount of quality metrics that we're required to capture and report. It's in the public domain. Uh, our first and foremost most mission is to make sure the patients receive safe care in our system uh, and that uh, we provide high quality care. Um, uh, but uh, there are also many, many governmental programs for quality reporting that we participate in. And so I oversee all of the, the many, many excellent uh, staff that I have here that, that work on, on doing all of the quality programs. Uh, how did you get to the University of Oklahoma, doctor? Are you a native? Um, no, I actually moved to Oklahoma in 1981 after I graduated from medical school, went to medical school in Kansas City, uh, came down to Tulsa, did my internship and residency for four years at what is now OSU Medical Center. At that time, it was Tulsa Regional Medical Center. Uh, and then I practiced internal medicine in Tulsa for about 15 years, uh, seeing patients both at uh, what is now OSU Medical Center, St. John Medical Center, and Hillcrest Medical Center. Um, about 10 years into my practice, I decided to pursue a degree in public health, and so I received my master's degree in public health, um, and then took a job here in Oklahoma City um, as the, first the chief medical officer, and then subsequently the CEO of the Oklahoma Foundation for Medical Quality. Uh, and I did that for about 10 years, and then I joined the faculty here in the Hudson College of Public Health. And how did you, how did you decide uh, this specific range of studies, to go from a <coughs> practicing MD to uh, uh, moving more into the public health specter? What, what drew you to that field? Yeah, so I, I had a very, very busy practice in Tulsa. Uh, internal medicine and uh, a large both ambulatory practice, but in particular, a very, very large hospital practice, uh, which, um, you know, to a certain extent, I think I experienced burnout that happens to a lot of doctors that got really busy. I, I literally lived in the hospital many, many hours each day, uh, took care of a lot of patients in the intensive care unit and other settings. I knew I wanted to do more in my career, and so I pursued uh, the Master of Public Health degree because I was interested in starting to get into some research work. Uh, and then when I went to work for the Oklahoma Foundation for Medical Quality, uh, we won some national contracts with the Medicare program uh, to build national quality metrics for hospitals related to a variety of topics, including treating and improving the care of patients with pneumonia, improving adult vaccination rates, uh, particularly in the hospital setting. And then the area that I ended up focusing on for more than 20 years was the prevention of surgical infections, which has been my primary area of research for many years. The uh, uh, resume that I was looking at to introduce you uh, mentioned that you were a fellow in the Infectious Disease Society of the United States. Uh, what uh, drew you toward that? the infectious disease side of medicine. Yeah, so it, it turns out that when I started doing uh, some of the early research, much of it was related to infectious diseases. So uh, one of the first areas that I, I started studying was uh, the quality of care for patients with pneumonia. Uh, that moved on then to vaccinations. Uh, and then in about um, 25 years ago almost now, we started studying surgical infections, and I was linked up with many of the nation's experts in, in both surgery and surgical infections, preventing infections, and did a lot of work with the Infectious Diseases Society of America. Um, that society then uh, asked me to be the lead author and to uh, help them write national guidelines on picking antibiotics to prevent surgical infections. And so I led that team. We published that work in 2013. Uh, and I've subsequently published two other national guidelines on preventing surgical infections and uh, was awarded fellowship in the Infectious Diseases Society for the, for the work that I had done uh, promoting the society and, and doing those guidelines. 
Dr. Bratzler, we're all pretty familiar now with the standard numbers, uh, the number of people who have been infected, uh, the number of people whose death could be attributed to COVID. Are there other numbers that you specifically want to look at on a daily basis or an hourly basis or whatever that is? Are there other numbers that are available to public health officials um, that give you a kind of a, a, a better direction of where a, a, a state in this case is headed? Yeah, so for COVID-19, of course, I came into that role just a little bit over uh, six weeks ago when President Harris asked me to be the university chief COVID officer. Uh, we we'd had a large team here in the Health Sciences Center campus that had been watching the data for quite some time. And when I look at the daily numbers, of course, I look at the same numbers that you see that are widely promoted, the daily case numbers. Um, I look at the seven-day rolling average right now. We're at about 950 new cases on average per day in Oklahoma. But the other ones that I look at very carefully are the percentage of tests that are run that are positive. I think it's an early indicator of what we're going to see with the disease. And interestingly, since we've seen a number of communities now uh, that have passed mask mandates, we're actually starting to see that in those communities, the percentage of the tests, the actual tests that are done that are positive has been starting to go down. Uh, and so that's exactly what we hope for. That's the metric that I watch very carefully. I also look at hospitalization numbers um, because as you know, the more people you have in the hospital, particularly in an intensive care unit bed, we're gonna continue to see more deaths from the disease. Prior to uh, getting an effective vaccine, is there any particular level of positivity, if that's what you were talking about uh, watching, that you would deem acceptable for COVID uh, from what it is today, which is I presume a good bit higher than something acceptable. Yeah, so right now we're running about, if you look at all of the COVID tests that are actually done in Oklahoma right now, somewhere around 10%, 10 to 11% are coming back positive. Now that varies substantially by the population being tested. So there are areas of the state where we're seeing 20 and 30% positive rates um, in certain populations where the disease is spreading rapidly. But remember, the week of May 25th, Oklahoma had that positive rate down to 1.8% for that week, which is the lowest it had been. Uh, and it reflected all of the, the mitigation strategies that had put, been put into place to, to close businesses or stop some of the uh, social gatherings and other things that had happened. And it worked very effectively. We got it down to 1.8%. We're now running, as I mentioned, up around 10 to 11% positive rate. Let's uh, break right there uh, and uh, take a little time for our commercial sponsors. Uh, you're watching The Verdict with Dr. Dale Bratzler and Mick Cornett. Uh, we'll be right back. OU Law has a history and heritage that are unparalleled. At the University of Oklahoma College of Law, we empower our students to pursue the career of their dreams. We have the highest U.S. news ranking ever achieved by an Oklahoma law school. We are the first law school in the country to launch a college-wide digital initiative. And this year, our competition teams rank number two in the nation. OU Law, generations of excellence, limitless possibilities. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. That's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma, loyal to you. Welcome back 
Collective Verdict. Kent Myers and Mick Cornett visiting with Dr. Dale Brassler from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, Mick, where would you like to go now? I'd like to talk uh, about how the virus uh, seems to uh, be more of a regional issue in some parts of the state than others. Dr. Bretzler, what, what do you attribute that to and where are the hot spots in Oklahoma? So there have been a number of hot spots that have developed around the state that I think you, you know about that have been in the, in, the, in the news a lot. So for instance, we had the meat packing plant out in Guymon. So Texas County there for a while was a real hot spot. And then we had a Tyson chicken factory down uh, around the uh, uh, McCurtain County down south, uh, southeast Oklahoma that's been a, a hot spot. Tulsa County had several outbreaks. Uh, and in fact, Tulsa County was the leading county in the state for new cases for quite some time uh, after they had a couple of big uh, uh, funerals where they had outbreaks and some weddings, and then it got into one of the manufacturing businesses in Tulsa. Um, right now, some of the areas that we're seeing some real hot spots are in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City now has the most uh, new cases in the state. Um, uh, we've seen a hot spot in southwest Oklahoma City uh, as we're starting to see some uh, distribution of the disease in the Hispanic and Latino uh, population. If you look at state health department um, uh, data, about 20% of the new cases have been occurring in that population uh, in our state. Um, and so we're, we're watching it. It varies um, fairly rapidly where you start to see hot spots. Uh, there are a few other counties that have had some individual hot spots along the way. <clears throat> Let me ask you, sir, uh, what is uh, your biggest concern uh, insofar as the status of COVID-19 in Oklahoma? Well, you know, we, we had really, I think, done an effective job early on of really bringing it under control. And then as we started, as I've said many times before, re, a lot of people took reopening to mean that we could go back to normal. We could go back to behaving the way that we did before this pandemic started, which meant you could get into crowds. You didn't have to wear things like masks. Uh, it was okay. And while I'm very supportive of the concept of opening our economy and making sure that we keep our businesses viable, um, we have to remember this is a very, very contagious virus most Oklahomans are still susceptible to it. If you look at antibody data in our state, the vast majority of Oklahomans are not immune to this disease yet. So it can still spread rapidly through our population. And, and since there is no vaccine available or any treatments that have been shown to prevent this particular disease, uh, I think right now where we're left is, is practicing public health, uh, which includes those things that you've probably heard so many times before, staying away from large crowds, wearing a mask, trying to physical distance, uh, doing hand hygiene, um, and uh, you know, stay home if you don't have to go out, support restaurants by, by having food delivered or pick up, uh, which is, you know, supports the restaurant's business, but also protects you. Dr. Bratzler, in your opinion, who should be tested if they have not been tested? And do we have the capacity for everyone to be tested right now? What's, what's the responsible thing for a citizen of Oklahoma to do if they've not been tested? Yeah, so remember, most of the tests that we do tell you your status today which could change tomorrow if you go out into a setting where you get infected. So, so I'm not a proponent of the concept of testing everybody because that just tells you that day what's actually going on with that particular person. Um, so anybody that has contact with somebody with COVID-19, uh, anybody that develops the symptoms of COVID-19, that list has gotten fairly long, but if you have an unusual upper respiratory infection, a cough, fever, if you start having GI symptoms like diarrhea or nausea, headaches, uh, just profound fatigue, or one that we've seen in young people a lot, that loss of taste and smell, if those things happen, then that's a person that needs to be tested uh, because we want to identify anybody that has the infection as soon as possible so we can get them isolated so they don't spread the infection to other people. Uh, you may receive a call from uh, a county health department or the state health department if some, one of the people that you work with, for instance, uh, tests positive, uh, the, the county health department or the state health department is going to call you to do contact tracing to, to find out whether or not you had direct contact with that person and they may recommend testing also. 
We uh, broadcast in the Tulsa metropolitan area and the Oklahoma City metropolitan area, but we also YouTube uh, any place YouTube goes. Uh, insofar as one of our viewers today, if they feel like they are having a symptom, and let's just say that they, uh, I'll ask you two questions, one for Oklahoma County and one for Tulsa. If they live in Oklahoma County, what should they do to start the process to be tested? So I think you have a variety of options now. And that's the good news is that there is a lot more testing available. You can always call 211, the state health department hotline, and they will direct you to one of the county or city uh, testing sites. Uh, for instance, on our OU campus, we're getting ready to open a very large uh, testing site in the Harold Ham uh, diabetes parking lot, out in the parking lot away from the building and away from other patients, uh, but it will be drive through and very, very uh, large. Uh, the College of Nursing has been running one. So there are a variety of sites that if you call 211, they will refer you to a site that's as close as possible to your location. The other thing is many primary care offices do have the capability to do testing. I always advise that you call first uh, so they know why you're coming, uh, so they can prepare for you. And then many urgent care centers in the Oklahoma City Metro and Tulsa Metro uh, are also doing rapid screening tests uh, for COVID-19. So there are quite a variety of options to get a test done now, but you should call in advance because some of these places have appointments. And as you know, because we've had so many new cases in Oklahoma, we've seen a lot of uh, longer wait times to get in to get testing done. So call around and you can often find a place to get tested. Dr. Bradson, I'd like to learn more about the mask. Uh, I assume some masks are better than others. And at what point should you say, you know, I've had this mask for a week or a month, I probably ought to get a different mask. How often should people, you know, look to, to move along in that area? So I, I'm a strong advocate for wearing a mask because uh, as I've pointed out now many times, since this first started in March, April, uh, you know, back when, when experts, CDC and others weren't recommending masks, there were, there were a couple of reasons they weren't recommending them at the time. One is that um, we were trying to preserve masks uh, for healthcare workers that were in the face of patients with COVID-19. Uh, you know, 8% of the people that have been infected in Oklahoma so far are healthcare workers. Uh, and so we, we were trying to preserve that personal protective equipment for them. The second reason was we didn't understand completely the transmission of this disease from one person to another. But there have been multiple studies that have been published since that time that have shown us a couple of things. Number one, this virus is primarily transmitted from one person to another. When the droplets that come out of your mouth, when you speak, when you cough or sneeze, are inhaled by somebody else. So that's actually pretty clear now. That's the principal mode of transmission of the virus. And, and typically, from somebody that's reasonably close, we know that the farther you physical distance, the less risk of getting the infection. Uh, the second thing is we know that wearing a mask the principal reason to do so is to keep those droplets that are coming out of your mouth when you're speaking, singing, coughing, sneezing, um, they, they, will, they will keep uh, those droplets in so they don't get into the air around you. Wearing a mask though often also probably protects you to some degree because if those droplets are in the air, they may prevent you from, um, from inhaling some of those droplets. Um, so. Uh, in terms of the type of mask, you know, I tell, I tell people there are two kind of general categories of masks. There's the N95 mask that should be reserved for healthcare workers. We actually fit them. They have to be fitted to our face to make sure that they effectively filter. And we use those when we're in the face of patients that could be infected. And then there are the surgical type masks that you can buy in boxes now, Walmart and all sorts of places sell them now. Um, and, and, uh, and then just simple cloth mask. Now, the good news is studies have shown that even a simple cloth mask is very effective at keeping the droplets from coming out of your mouth. We're not trying to filter viruses or other things. What we're trying to do is keep droplets from getting out of your mouth. And so cloth masks are very effective. How long should you keep them? 
cloth masks you should wash. You should wash frequently. I don't wash mine necessarily every day, but two or three times a week, I try to remember to either wash it in the sink with soap and water or uh, throw it in the washing machine. Um, for surgical type mask, our policy here on this campus is you can wear one for up to five days uh, max before or until it's soiled. If we see that they're soiled or we've hit five days, we typically throw them away and uh, use a new one. Uh, Dr. Bratzler, we have to take a break here and to close the show. Thank you so much for coming to us. Uh, good luck on your uh, upcoming fall semester at, uh, at the University of Oklahoma. On behalf of Mick Cornett, Dr. Dale Bratzler, you're watching The Verdict and we'll be right back. It used to be okay in hospitals. It used to be okay in movie theaters. It was okay in classrooms, restaurants, and airplanes. But thanks to a greater understanding of the dangers, that's not okay anymore. So now that we know secondhand smoke causes lifelong health problems, why is it still okay to smoke with children in the car? Bottom line, it's not okay. Let's get serious about protecting kids. Join the fight at StopsWithMe.com. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You have uh, uh, children come from a different lifestyle, different mindset. You have to open your arms and really do what you have to do to have that child become a part of your family. And if it's more patience, that's what you do. Kids got to know they can trust you. And that's what we try to do with these kids. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Thanks, folks, for watching The Verdict. We're absolutely out of time for Mick Cornett. We thank you very much for walk watching, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>